And now for our speaker, Dr. Stuart Armstrong, fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. And I've been following his work for 10 or 15 years. It's work in the area of artificial intelligence, existential risk, but in so many other areas like uh, the future of space exploration and the long-term future of humanity and many, many other areas. So it's just fascinating to keep up with his writings if you can. And uh, Stuart, over to you. Ah, oh, thanks. And that, uh, that side project on space exploration really sort of paid off. Um, it's uh, lots of people are really interested in that. Though all we did was just take all the data that was already there and take it seriously and put it together. Uh, anyway, but that's not what we're here for this time. This is for um, the optimistically uh, uh, optimistically entitled A Path to Solving AI Alignment. Right, do people see the screen now? Okay, that's fine. Um, so there is the uh, somebody's law of headlines that whenever a headline starts with a question, the answer is no. And um, this is a big claim I'm making here. So um, treat it with skepticism, uh, but this, I am getting the feeling that there are better digital law, thank you, that there are, that the end of AI safety might be in sight in the positive sense. And the subtitle here is that every, with uh, caveats and the stars there, every problem in AI is out of distribution behavior. Now, my genuine reason to think that we might be getting close to solving AI safety is a lot of things moving in a lot of directions and many of these coming together. But here, I'll just be focusing on one big idea, um, which I've been kind of, it's, in all my attempts to solve AIs from very different perspectives, some with reduced impact, alignment, value learning, I've, or, uh, or sort of nature of power limiting AIs, I keep on finding in a sense that this, it's the same problem that comes up every time. And this single problem is what I'm going to sketch out uh, today. Now, as Tetlock has said, between the uh, fox that knows many things and the hedgehog that knows one thing well, uh, the fox is much better at prediction and pretty much anything else. So uh, this is one big idea, my current big idea. Um, so do take caveats on that. But with the, all the uh, disclaimers in place. Let's go for it. So the subtitle was that every problem in AI is out of distribution behavior. Or more accurately, every problem in AI is what I'm calling model splintering. And out of distribution behavior is just a specific example of that kind of behavior. And to kick off uh, and uh, looking at what model splintering is, let's talk about nationalism. Um, good old familiar nationalism that has always only caused positive things uh, throughout human history. But there are lots of nations, lots of nationalisms, and philosophers have developed a theory of what nations are and what nationalism might entail. This is a book with a lot of thought put into it. But the thing that I would say is that the most nationalistic people you will meet are not generally the people who have read the book Defining a Nation and who can articulate in deep philosophical detail what a nation is, rather the opposite. So it, 
it does seem it does seem that the strongest nationalists are some of the least capable of defining what a nation is. And you might be tempted at this point to say that they don't actually have the preferences they claim, but I think a better way of thinking of it is that they have a strong preference, it's just underdefined. Because after all, if they're strongly nationalist, you can already predict quite a lot about them, which flags they're going to wave, when and how often they might be doing this, who they will trust and who they tend not to trust, and their opinions as to which kind of people can go uh, into their country and in what context and that kind of thing. These are predictions. So it's clearly nationalism is something, um, but clearly it's not something well defined. So this is sort of the, in a sense, the first insight is that pretty much all of our preferences are of this type. I chose nationalism because it's uh, one that people in uh, less wrong uh, tend to not so much have uh, the instinctive feeling. So this is a sort of outside view uh, for many of us, but most of our preference are of this type and the this makes sense here and we, like human rights may be more popular uh, amongst some people, but this makes sense in this context, but just doesn't scale is the central idea. Uh, as another example, consider a Croatian communist Yugoslav nationalist in the 1980s. Now, this person has a clear and single identity. Every aspect of their identity overlaps, but there's going to be the 1990s, and when that happens, their identity are going to splinter. The communist, the Croatian, and the Yugoslav nationalist bits are going to fly off in different pieces. And then they're going to have to determine what they thought was one identity is now at least three, and they're going to have to sort out which piece of it uh, is going to be their preferences or their identity going forth. So this is the sort of splintering where a single concept breaks up into pieces and we have to mess around with the pieces and figure out which one we want to keep and which one we don't want to keep. And it may not, the decision we make may sort of depend on whims or random facts. It might go one way or the other and not be particularly principled reasons. And then we'll build principles on our new values. So examples from the past, these are moral examples. Um, so one from really far in the past, honor uh, is vital. And this is one that has completely splintered, completely broken down. If uh, you look at the Wikipedia page, there's a long list about um, face being impressive in combat, uh, chastity, at least uh, for a woman, uh, keeping your promises. It basically, if you, if we didn't know what honor was, we'd assume that someone had been plucking concepts uh, out of uh, a bowl and tying them together. Um, but we do have some understanding of honor, but not some as much as the people in the past did, where they thought this was one clear thing. And different different cultures had different concepts of honor, but they they different each of them thought that it was a clear single concept. Uh, and this one has completely breaking, uh, broken down. A one that is in the process of breaking down, the sort of uh, Victorian ideal, woman should be protected. Uh, very strong ideal uh, for the time, not necessarily honored, but it was, this is the uh, public position of many people. And this is breaking down as, well, the idea of gender is splintering as I'll uh, show a bit later. And finally, there's um, this is one I would say for the future that happiness is important. Let's just stick even with just hedonic happiness. I think that hedonic happiness feels like one thing uh, or a small collection of related things, but this may break up into many different things in 50 or 100 years um, in connected with identity, with experience, 
with uh, the various hormones, with the memories of these experiences, and so on. So this is something that I expect will go the same way that honor has gone in the past. And because of this, because happiness is such an important feature of say AI alignment or building an ideal future, if we don't, if we we don't have a print, we need a principled way of extending uh, values when the concepts that they're based on uh, break into pieces. Um, and this isn't just in values, though I've been using that example. The this exists in uh, well, out in dis distribution in machine learning is a variant of that. Um, the concepts that the neural net has learned to distinguish what a cat is uh, are no longer valid out of distribution. And we have the old examples of uh, different parts of science and the so-called bridging laws. We have the ideal gas laws. We have the slightly more sophisticated Van der Waal equations. And we have the model in which we see atoms moving about. And the question, and of course the quantum variant of that, but the question that I'd be asking is, where is pressure in the, in the last picture when we can see the atoms or model the atoms? Of course we can figure out pressure by averaging velocity of the gas molecules and so on. There's formulas for that. But I would say that pressure doesn't really exist when we can see all the positions and velocities of the molecules. It's not a concept that makes sense of that scale. So the concept of pressure, even though in this more scientific environment, we can figure it out fully, unlike say honor, but it's not something that lives naturally in the world of atoms uh, moving about. It's, uh, it's something that lives naturally in the world of gases and the macroscopic scale. Um, and then we have Eliezer's famous Bleg and Rube uh, example. A Bleg, which is a blue egg, versus a Rube, which is a red cube. And they have certain features in common. Um, uh, the Bleg glows in the dark, contains vanadium and is furred, whereas the Rube is smooth, does not glow in the dark, and contains palladium. And what I'm imagining is that there's a training environment in which the human tree, um, the human teaches an AI to distinguish between the blegs and the rubes. And the human is just doing it by color. That's all they see, that's all they care about. The AI is observing its behavior, but the AI can see more. It can see the shapes, the, uh, the texture, and the luminescence. So it is noting down all the four concepts. And then later on, we are, it is presented with a red, dark, furred egg with vanadium inside. So something that does not correspond to anything that it has encountered. And also its interior is not even something that it was the AI was detecting at the point where it was learning. So I would say that this is sort of the simplest example of a model splintering. Um, there was a concept bleg versus rube. That was the, the feature. Everything was one or the other. You lived in a world where there were blegs and rubes. And now all of a sudden you have something where these five features that always went together, they've now splintered into different pieces. And depending on what your preferences were for Bleg and Rube, you now have to figure out how to extend it to these new uh, unknown objects. And to get back to morality a bit, um, we can use this example of someone in the middle of England and during this period of in hi history, 14, 40 to 1470 roughly. And we travel back in time and give them an AI 
and full knowledge of how to program an AI, and we want them to produce an aligned AI. And the sort of concepts that they might be using to define morality would be money, harvest, feudal duty, teaching children, spears and armor. The vitally important issue of York, the House of York versus the House of Lancaster. Um, and uh, this is obviously something that they must the, that must be determined for the ages. The House of Warwick, um, God, morality, hierarchy. These are the sort of issues that will go into creating their AI. But the AI's perspective might be of not just the small the town of Warwick in England in this era, but the whole of the earth for the whole of human history, or more, uh, more appropriately, the whole of the universe and everything that could be made by the AI and by humanity. And in this mega possibility of, uh, of space there, it'll have to somehow extend uh, preferences of York versus Lancaster uh, from these peasants of those era without going crazy or optimizing the world into little York flags or the standard failure modes of, uh, of uh, AIs. Uh, so here, the concepts of splintered and of completely broken, how can they be put back uh, together? Now, I said that this was, in a sense, the only problem in AI. Um, and here I'm committing the PowerPoint sin of just doing a wall of text. But I'm just rapidly going to list the various um, aspects, how this applies to all of the uh, problems in AI. The hidden complexity of wishes, save my mother. The concept of save and mother are underdefined. It doesn't know what to do with these uh, in, in the extreme cases. An ontological crisis is precisely when physics models splinter, when the concepts of uh, the physics no longer make sense. Some are looking for conservative behavior. And one weakness of most of these uh, approaches is you don't know when to be conservative and when not to. But when these models or the important features start splintering, that's the moment to uh, be so. OK, I'm not going to read all of these aspects there. I can put the list um, up uh, again later. But um, I'll just go to the end, the whole friendly AI problem. The sort of idea is that what a friendly AI should do is kind of well defined in very typical low stress, low energy, low power situations. The kind, when we tend to tell an AI, go make me a cup of coffee, we know what we want and we know what we don't want in that. And within a training environment, if you want, that is really relatively quite easy to define. The issue is, of course, when you lift this to all the possibilities of the world and that the AI could bring us into. Um, now, I'm going to do a brief mathematical uh, interlude here, um, which you don't have to follow particularly. It's for those who want to see some formalism, and uh, that uh, this would help some of them. Uh, I've defined what I call generalized models, which consist of a set of features uh, in this ge geological thing, rain and snow, waterfall, floodplain. These are key features. A set of environments, which are mainly defined as what features you would find together and what ones you wouldn't. And Q, a probability distribution over these features. It can also be a partial probability distribution. It doesn't have to be fully defined. Um, but I will treat it as a standard probability distribution because that's a lot easier to explain. And this is not time-based or update-based necessarily. This is something like 
the feature delta is found within the feature floodplain zone. So the probability of floodplain zone given delta is one, uh, for example. And these are, I'm trying to make them as general as possible so that pretty much any model can be captured within this or as much as many models as possible. And then I'm going to splinter these models, break the features down and see if we can transition across. Now, if we have two such generalized models, uh, you, you might think of them as the ideal gas laws versus the atoms bouncing around, but you don't have to. You can define a relation between um, the two environments, the environments of the first and the environments of the second. And a relation is just you a generalization of the function. You draw lines between points in one and points in the other. Uh, it doesn't have to be a function. There doesn't have to be lines from every point. Uh, there can be bifur bifurcations in both sides. So general relation. And the idea is that this is a transition between the two models and the probability is imagined to be flowing along these lines. So uh, probability splits, say, from one point where there's two lines going out of it, and the probability of that point flows along the two lines and connected from it. And to represent that, R is a map between the two generalized models if these two conditions are preserved. Um, this relates the two probability distributions Q0 and Q1. The R of the point is the set of all elements that it is related to, and the R inverse is the other way around, the set of elements that relate to that one. And these two conditions together turn out to be actually surprisingly restrictive. And for those who are into category theory, if I define my morphisms this way, then this is a category. And the morphisms go together as in the nice way that you would expect. And I'm finally going to define what a refinement is. These, this sort of construction is kind of, you're keeping the same quality of data, but maybe expressing it differently. A refinement is you have an improvement. And in this case, you have three models, M0, M1, and M1 prime. M1 prime only differs in its probability distribution. And so a refinement is this R, this morphism exists. It is one to many, which I'll show in a second. And in a certain sense, the Q1 prime is better than the distribution Q1. Now, one to many is shown by this graph. Um, the, every point has a multiple of lines that go out and it goes to separate points. The idea here is that the M1 model is more precise than, is strictly more precise than the M0 model because it has, if you want the, so the E0 has three environments, but each environment there has several possible environments on the M1 side. And the Q1 is better, better, more, either more accurate or maybe uh, simpler, better connected with the features or whatever criteria we're using for the measure of better. So for example, we can go from the ideal gas laws to atoms bouncing around, but if we want the Q0 and the Q1 to be the same, the atoms have to bounce around in a very simplified, unrealistic way. Uh, and then the idea is that we then move to Q1 prime, where we put in the uh, more accurate models for how the atoms move. So this is a refinement and it's better, it's better model of it's a better model of reality. This is the end of the mathematical interlude. 
And now we'll go back to examples. So this is physics. In Epsilon, uh, ignore the bottom two lines. They shouldn't be there. Um, the first environment is a universe with position velocities of particles. And the, the Q uh, encodes the Newtonian laws of physics, such as momentum is preserved and momentum is preserved conditional on velocities being low. Is just two examples of something that you'd have in that universe. Then the second one is a universe which also contains the curvature of space time. So now we can go for general relativity. And general relativity preserves four momentums, uh, not uh, momentums. So when we move to the refinement, we can refine our model to go to the M1. Then our previous probabilities uh, no longer exist. Q1 is an improvement. However, there is a sense in which these two things are pretty much the same or approximations of each other um, or the Newtonian, the Q01 is the Newtonian approximation of the general relativity one. And the key point is velocities low because the, the E0 is not really where it started. Where it started is on the minus one. And this is a universe with slow moving particles. In fact, this is the where it really started is this is the bit of Earth that we can see and talk about and the, the planets and stars that we can see move in the heavens and the experiments that we can do. And from this, Newton and others extrapolated the universal laws. And but on this real universe where we live, the, the uh, general relativity works well. Like if you notice that the, the E0 universe and the E1 universe contradict each other, the E0, for instance, predicts you can go faster than light um, by just throwing something at three quarters of the light speed and then it throws something at three quarters of the light speed. This is very wrong. But this came from a, the reason that universe came from extrapolating a universe where we know where we haven't seen anything go faster than light. I feel that this may be losing people, so I'll just zoom uh, on. The, the main bit about returning to the what we know is that this is sort of equivalent with going back to the training environment. When the AI encounters the red dark furred egg with vanadium, I want it to go back to the training environment. It may have learned four features, but as it grows, it will have learned the fifth feature. And then I want it to go back to the training environment and reconstruct this based on this five features not the ones that it learned, and also seeing what the human used to distinguish it, whether the human, the color is only what the human wanted, or whether all the uh, features, including the ones that were not visible at the time, are the ones to be taken into account. So the automating of what do we do with this new object is the process that I'm trying to get here. Now we can have a little a little more look at the gender issue. This might be easier to follow. So let's look at the environment, which is the collection of middle class people in England in the 1860s. And if you look at features, well, gender is very informative here of quite a lot of other features, like the probability that you own property, given that you're female and married, is very close to zero. The probability that you can vote, given that you're female, is very, very close to zero, that you have a job, and so on, So, and wearing trousers. But now let's, so, and this is also a universe in which gender is pretty well defined. It has, it connects many different things. You might, 
if you look at someone and see they have a dress, you can immediately conclude and relatively safely conclude vast amount of stuff about them. But let's extend our environment a little bit. People in England in general in the 1860s. Now here we can start scratching off the has a job uh, probability being zero because there are well female servants, uh, for example, they work uh, quite a lot. So we've extended our environments and we're starting to get some of these probabilities failing. Then we move to people in England across the whole 19th century. And now it is no longer the case that married uh, women cannot own property. We extend to people in England in the 19th and 20th century, and now all of these have fallen. Now, there's been, we talk a lot about today about re-questioning the gender binary and is gender even anything anymore? But actually the gender binary has been breaking apart for a long, long time. Middle-class Victorian England, the gender binary is very clear and all the features that are connected with gender are very clear. But now, even before we started questioning whether gender exists or what it means, most of the features that went with it were broken. So gender, even in say 1960, is a much weaker concept than it was in 1860. And so anything articulated in terms of gender back in the 1860s um, would have had to transition somehow to something different over the course of the centuries uh, that came after. Yeah, gender has splintered. And now this is my last example here. And this is where the being aware of model splintering and dealing with it, I can sh show a bit more directly how this might be useful for designing uh, safe AI. You start with the idea that you will train a robot cancer surgeon and you're going to train it, you're going to give it lots of examples of human surgeons and human surgeries. And you can do quite a lot of things. First of all, you might be able to get it to perform as a human surgeon. This is apprenticeship learning. We have a lot of algorithms for this. We might want it to perform as a perfect human surgeon or even yeah, the idealized human surgery capacity. We can we can do this, we can do apprenticeship learning and we can mess around with our choice of examples and we can probably achieve this uh, without too much difficulty if we could achieve the first level. Then we can go to sort of more extreme options, like uh, instead of using scalpels, the robot finds a way to use lasers to do extract tumors in idealized, perfect, painless uh, ways. So this is extremely superhuman level of performance. This is what we'd want it to do. But we can't get here directly by apprenticeship learning. We sort of have to give it some sort of goal that may involve, say, diminishing the number of cancer cells. But of course, if we do that, then we run the risk that it'll go for the next option, which is dissolving the patient with acid. This is the standard friendly AI failure mode. So, the key thing that we're looking for is a way of distinguishing three from four. Both of these are extreme and off the training environment. One of them is desirable, the other one is not. And one thing we can do is to have the AI discover and seek to preserve implicit features, not the features that we've given it, but features that are implicitly there in the examples that we've given it. So if we consider a successful, a, a patient on which there's been a successful operation, they have a bunch of uh, features that I've denoted here. Um, they typically survive the operation. That's a really good uh, uh, plus point. And they survive for some years after. This is also a really good thing. 
they end up paying more taxes because they survive and they generally thank the surgeon also because because the operation was a success these are less important so i've denoted them in orange they're also more likely to complain about the pain because they're still around to complain about it and they are more likely to uh, have dementia because they will also be surviving long enough these are things that i've denoted in red because they're negative but what we would want the algorithm to do is to collect these features not, not the ones we've given it to it so figure out what are the features of successful operations the ones that are unsuccessful and to aim to preserve them as much as possible now this may end up with the robots doing a perfect painless operation and then whacking the human on the heads to balance out the pain so that it complains to the right extent and that's that's okay that's the price of conservatism and we can we can then specifically remove that feature from consideration uh, later on but the basic idea is that it generates the features so feature splintering is not an issue because we're not fixing them in a model it's generating them and it's seeking to preserve them and identify the difference between a successful operation and an unsuccessful operation and extend this concept of the difference to whatever hypothetical word, world it may exist in. Anyway, this is a very superficial look at an idea that is currently developing. And so I just wanted to say thanks and that these approaches might ensure the future. I'm personally pretty optimistic on it, but at a sort of meta level, I know that I shouldn't just trust my own judgment. So um, th uh, thanks everyone and um, give me uh, entertaining questions. Okay, so thank you. Let's go to the questions. Uh, everybody look on the icon on your upper right there's a triangle, circle, square, and then click, and then it says Q&A. And you can ask your questions, and you can also vote on other questions. So I'll read them off in uh, approximate order of uh, popularity, approximate order of vote. So just keep on asking those. Um, Yes, Should Rebecca I? Gorman asked on the site, Rebecca Gorman asked, do you believe that the development of safe AI will be driven by market conditions. Why or why not? Um, well, um, that's a very general question. I believe market conditions will contribute to the development of AI. Uh, and that there's, um, there's, let me give you the academic answer. There are many possible outcomes here. Um, market conditions have some strong commitments to the um, uh, to the safe AI in that, for instance, the companies want the AIs to stay under their control. So they want to solve the alignment problem, at least uh, at that level. So from a selfish perspective, they do want to solve some aspects of the alignment problem. And from a publicity aspect, they may want to cr create agents that are well behaved. But of course, there's the competition in, in, uh, in the market and the desire to economize on safety precautions. I have a paper on this. There's a model of, uh, what was it? Uh, racing, to, racing to the precipice, a model of AI development. And it's, it's a neat little paper. It says pretty much what you expect. More competition between antagonistic organization is more dangerous. Uh, the only thing that we found that's quite interesting is that information was not, more information is not necessarily safer. Sometimes less information was uh, better. Sometimes more was better. 
uh, it was a uh, it was difficult to predict. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so um, there's going to be a lot of things going on. I don't know. Um, and they, it looks like commercial is a way ahead of government and academic at the moment on AI development. And in this extent, it might be a positive that some of that there's a certain amount of monopoly power in um, uh, in the um, uh, in the computer world. Uh, because monopolies, though they're bad in many ways, they have a little bit more slack um, than uh, the than in a, comp a competitive environment. But basically, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Martin Covrigo asks, how do you envision a collaboration between organizations concerned with AI, both development and goal alignment, and these studying human preferences? Can we get to the point where we have computational definitions of suffering and happiness and use AI to safely optimize for fundamental bliss? Um, I mean, if you have the if you have the computational definitions, you and a, a few other issues like symbol grounding, you you have an AI, you can make an AI safely optimized for uh, bliss because you have the, um, you've defined it. And um, what was the first part about, or, yeah, so I have a, a long convoluted research agenda, which is to try and basically preserve all the aspects of human uh, preferences that we might want, that we might think of as a value, um, and in there, you would you might get bliss, but you would also keep sort of human as entities with identities, histories, uh, developments, experiences, and choices, and those kind of things. That's my sort of personal ideal. Um, as for how to get organizations to collaborate, that's more the AI policy people at the FHI who are working on that. I can pontificate on that, but I don't think it would be particularly useful. Okay. Um, Ole asked, if a safe path is figured out, is it necessary to get all AI developers on board with it? That sort of depends on how AIs develop. The, the simplest scenario is the first mover advantage, first singleton. So if the first AI, proper AI, AGI, general intelligence, takes over the world in commas or in, in uh, quotes or not in quotes, um, then there's no need for co uh, collaboration at all. It's it determines what happens, uh, and you don't care about the other ones not aligned. Um, the other, the multipolar scenarios where you have multiple powerful AIs gets more complicated. It's very easy to construct a scenario where competition forces mostly aligned AIs to become destructive of humans or competition forces unaligned AIs to become uh, more aligned and more friendly towards humans. Uh, which scenario you tend to find more realistic uh, depends on your, generally on your political priors rather than, um, so th this is something that is studied and is understudied. Um, I think that the, Ultimate singleton is quite high. I give that 70, 75 percent of the um, the space. As in that, even if you start out with a lot of different AIs with different goals, that they are able to negotiate binding deals with each other, so that ultimately they function as a single entity. Um, so the in that, if that comes to pass. The important thing is to get that singleton aligned and to prevent disasters in the meantime. However, if we're looking at a multipolar world, then you want something quite different. 
Um, Roland asks, how do we handle unknown unknowns? With skill and uh, passion and uh, no, um, in a sense, the whole model splintering approach is about uh, handling unknown unknowns. It's that this is your current model. These are the features you're trying to preserve. You know that at some point these splint features are going to splinter. Your current definitions are going to fail. You don't know how, but you know that this is going to happen or this is very likely to happen. And it's building up a certain resilience for these transitions, a resilience that's possible because humans actually demonstrate it. The uh, Croatian uh, communist Yugoslav nationalist would have, by the end of the 90s, found some set of values to commit to uh, or broken down. It's humans can navigate these kind of transitions. So getting if so, this is not an impossibility. So in a yeah, in a sense, coping with expected unknown unknowns is what um, model splintering is about. Uh, Steve Burns asks, what are the steps to get from the idea of model splintering to working code for a safe AGI? What are you working on now? Um, I'm working on a few other things, and especially I finished an encyclopedia article on AI ethics, which may come out uh, in one of these centuries. Um, but now there's a bit more time I'm going to I'm going to accumulate, my current plan is accumulate as many examples of this kind of behavior that I can. Some of the definitions are still fuzzy. When I put things into category theory, I, did, I didn't like category theory initially, but when I force this into category theory, it, it's improved the formalization. And I'm going to try and do that. The current formalization doesn't interact with the features that well. You notice the features didn't appear in any of the definitions. Uh, and I'm not happy with how that works. So forcing, collecting more examples, putting them into the formalism, and trying to get the formalism as general as possible is the first step. And then seeing how humans and algorithms negotiate this sort of transition is the sort of key the the, the first the first the clear the first clear idea that i have is that you should go back to the training environment when you encounter new features so if you realize that palladium versus vanadium is a feature of the environment you should go back to your training environment and retrain retrain yourself as if you had known that at the time so that's one way of coping, but that's with a particularly easy uh, sort of uh, feature splintering. Okay. Uh, Atria Garrigo Alonso asks, this feature preservation, is it just a consequence of what happens when you use inverse reinforcement learning with a featureized linear model? No. Um, it's basically when you try and describe your ideal world um, or when you try and train the uh, when you try and train an entity in that uh, direction. So when I went back to sort of nationalism is uh, is an underdefined fe uh, feature um, uh, nationalism is a well-defined preference over underdefined, features um, is the way I uh, prefer to, to look at it. So the, the features are, in a sense, the, the way that you have of describing your reality within the, the training environment or the set of environments that you're operating in. And they're particularly interesting when they're sort of morally relevant features. 
like ensure human flourishing. It is very possible in a very restricted set of test environment, training environments to point at 100 examples and say, this is human flourishing, and point at another 100 examples and saying, this is not human flourishing. So these are, so if you, okay, if you want, there's two sort of aspects to feature splintering. The first is the AI may articulate things in terms of features and itself, when it moves to a new environment, these features may splinter and it has to deal with that. That's in a sense out of distribution problems. The other problem is that our moral preferences are phrased in terms of feature that will splinter or that the AI could make splinter. And so the first is understanding of the world. How do you generalize it when your features splinter? The second is your reward function or your goals. How do you extend it when the features that defined it uh, splinter? Vincent Weister asks, okay. what's your view on concrete problems in AI safety and broader unalignment, even say by Facebook and YouTube algorithms, versus the very long-term existential threat of unaligned AGI? OK. I. So when you say concrete problems in AI, you mean concrete problems in AI rather than the paper called concrete problems in AI? I think so, yes. OK. Um, so I operate in terms of the superintelligence generally. The single superintelligence, uh, that's my mental model, and this is what I'm trying to align. The reason that I work on that is because most not all, but most of the techniques that would work to align a superintelligence would also work to align um, uh, what you call it, um, to align uh, less intelligence, less powerful agents. So that's, uh, that, that's why I, I always articulate things in terms of superintelligence uh, general or agents. Uh, and me, uh, but I do try and ensure some of these solutions extend. Like the, the connection between uh, model splintering and out of distribution um, problems is encouraging because out of distribution problem is definitely a current problem that people are currently working on. Okay. Um. Duncan Fowler asks, is the point of the 15th century morality discussion to point out that if 15th century morality seems dubious, then 21st century morality will also seem dubious to future people. And we must determine a true morality with which both 15th and 21st century morality emerges from. Um, the people in the future may only exist because of the AI's definition, uh, AI's actions. So we can't count on some sort of judgment of history because the AI itself may be creating that judgment of history. I'm also somewhat skeptical of the idea that there is necessarily a moral improvement as um, time goes on. Uh, the, the, my example is uh, that um, Germany in 1925, it would have been Really great if its morality had been frozen for a few decades uh, rather than allowed to change. But th there's more sort of sophisticated things as how much of moral improvement is because your current morality resembles because you have the morality of your times. How much of it is because the economy is generally better which allows satisfaction of more preferences, and how much is genuine moral improvement? Like, I do not have the strong group values. Um, like, honor is almost completely empty to me um, as a concept, except maybe for loyalty to your word or something like that. But I would like if there were 14th century people building AIs and I was with them. I would like part of their values to be preserved, even if they are ones that I disagree with. So, 
And I think that a lot of the, yeah. Um, and in a sense, I fear moral drift far more than I fear premature lock-in of moral values, especially because you can, um, if you draw a broad circle around moral concepts, a very powerful AI may be able to satisfy them all to a large extent. And so I'm much more comfortable with my, my concept of morality is being half, uh, half maximized and some concept of honor also being half maximized than to take the risk on 100% maximizing of something that might be very different uh, from me. Okay. Uh, Mark Jackson asked, in order to understand how machine consciousness might look and be, should we, should we spend more time studying our own states of consciousness, including altered states like dream states or other induced states? <laughs> I try and avoid consciousness uh, as much as possible uh, because we don't really understand consciousness, but everyone has an opinion on it. Um, so I don't find that the conversations on that are often so uh, productive. But in this example, it, in my work, I tend to focus on skills and bracket the idea of consciousness, except uh, I have written an occasional less wrong posts on that. We will ignore uh, that. But um, yeah, generally, I try to avoid the issue of consciousness because a extremely powerful non-conscious AI is very dangerous. A, an ex a weak conscious AI is not um, a threat or a boom particularly. So the level of power and skills seems to be the main, uh, the main issue, that and alignment rather than consciousness itself. Uh, Gittich Garnickson asks, is the current state of your mathematical theory publicly readable somewhere? Um, okay, uh, before answering this, I'll just, uh, some time ago I saw someone um, who said I did, he, he or she or they didn't see why my talk was optimistic. Um, maybe I should have emphasized this more because it feels like the problems. I've often felt that AI alignment was climbing a very long staircase in the dark, uh, and you don't know how many stairs there are. I am personally starting to get a feel for how many stairs there are and how many, uh, how much work we're making to progress on going over each step, and I don't feel that the gap is that large anymore. And, or, or maybe that there are big gaps, but they're specific. The, um, there's no big, there's, there's no longer the big conceptual gaps that I thought of before. And I can trace, for the first time, I can trace a realistic, a plausible sounding story that ends up with, and then we built an aligned AI and everything was wonderful. Um, so that's why I feel that it's optimistic. Now, maybe for someone who hasn't seen the magnitude of the problem, this might feel like, well, there's so much to do. And yes, there is so much to do, but it's visible a lot of what there is to do. Uh, yes, uh, sorry. So that was a previous question. And the other one is mathematical formalism. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I have a post on model splintering that doesn't do the formalism much. I've put on the category theory results in a recent post. Um, shall I, shall I, um, find, shall I paste the, those two links? Yeah, so continue asking me questions and I will um, go and paste those two links. The the first one is more a waffle on what this you could do with it and what it might be used for. And the last one is the mathematics. Um, 
yeah, gen, uh, generalized more, my, uh, models as a category. There's still a lot of mathematical development I need to do, but especially in terms of the features. But I, yeah, uh, but th th it is read. I think it is readable uh, at this point. Okay, so I uh, continue asking questions. I can type uh -huh. this while I think. Okay, uh, Roland Pilakas asks. Do you want to share examples of principles of resiliency against unknown unknowns in humans and in AI? Um, example of resiliency. Well, part of it is a form of detection of um, of model splintering in a sense that, like, wh why is it a lot harder to create, um, uh, uh, to create um, adversarial examples for humans than for AIs? Why can we not, if we have a cat, why can we not convince people that it's a car very easily? It's because we, okay, we, if we look at something and we say, and it's, and it's a cat and we think it's a bus, okay, well, that's a bus. Where are its wheels? Strange, this bus doesn't have wheels. It also doesn't have windows. It also doesn't have a roof. It isn't on a road. It has fur. Um, so the, all the concepts that all went together with bus are no longer there. So even if in most situations, if we saw something and were for a moment, the sort of cat concept floated in our uh, brains, it, that feature would not fit with all the other features. So that's one sort of step of resiliency, which is to detect that, um, that the different features are not pointing in the same direction. Now, I haven't found good specific examples of that, but I do know that they have, in certain cases of machine learning, they train different models to predict the, um, the same thing. And then they go to a more generalized environment. And then it would be when your different models start diverging from each other that this is a sign that you've moved off your training environment, that you need to be careful that this is the moment for conservative and uh, behavior. So the sort of, and there's also, well, there's actual papers on detecting out of distribution effects. So in a sense, that's already started. So the first step is to detect that your, um, you're in that situation. It's the next steps, which are the harder ones. And there's a few examples of what you can do. As I say, becoming conservative is one. Humans, what humans tend to do is, so start with the woman need to be protected and think about how you might generalize that as the years go by. Well, it's, that would translate maybe as those vulnerable in society have to be protected because that, that feature connected with uh, women in that era uh, and extends more across time. Or maybe, well, the, what about protected? That means they have to be insured a decent life and uh, not, uh, not suffering. So the, when, we, when we do our moral improvement or when we refine our moral judgments, we tend to, um, we tend to do that to find something that applied across our old values and now extends. And that to some extent, this choice could be arbitrary and to some extent, maybe it's, um, it's, uh, would be good to have a way of doing it principally uh, in a principled way. Okay. So, uh, I'll ask another question from Norman Perlmutter. 
uh, please give more details of the fleshed out staircase that is no longer a staircase in the dark. What are all <laughs> the steps that lead to aligned AI? What part of them is solved by the topics discussed in today's talk? Well, to a, to a very weak level, everything is solved. Um, if you get, if you get more, if you can, if you can cope with model splintering, you can cope with anything um, in a sense. It's, this is reliant a lot on my personal experience and judgment. It's just that when playing with all, all sorts of different approaches and critiquing other people's approaches, it always comes to a moment of, yeah, okay, these would work in these environments. And if you extend it arbitrarily, it fails because the things fall apart. Um, and so that's, this is it, a large part, it is my own judgment that this problem is perennial and that instead of, instead of trying to figure it out all ahead of time uh, the better approach would be to expect the splinterings to happen and find a way to transition across it and as i say one strong thing is to look back to the past look back to the training environment and always be sure that the behaviors that you were taught in the training environments would still be done in your new setting and as many of the features as possible are preserved uh, in uh, or honored uh, the, if it's a preference thing in the new setting um yes uh, what what was the exact question it scrolled up and i can't see it uh, anymore uh, hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah. Or, or we can move on. Okay, good. Let's move on. So Craig uh, Quitter asks, it seems that the current AGI safety effort is significantly under-resourced in proportion to the importance of the problem. What can we do to motivate increased attention and resource to safe AGI development? <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. This is maybe another reason for my optimism. Uh, as compared with everyone uh, else. Yes, it is critically and cruelly under-resourced, but it's been so much worse uh, before. Uh, 10 years ago or so, I've been in much, much worse situation. So yes, we need to improve it. We need to get people on board, uh, raise money, do research, um, try and find practical applications of it. There's actually quite a lot of people who are working on how best to do all that. But it, it's just so amazing how much better it is now than it used to be. Um, Mark Jackson asks, uh, now that he's listened to you, if the goal is ultimately to stop the AI existing for itself and not including our welfare, is the answer to try to give an AI a sense of self-alignment with us? In other words, should programmers start studying psychology? Um, the, I think psychology is a good example of model splintering. Because if a programmer studies psychology, it might get something like humans thrive on, su on succeeding in very challenging of their environment or something like that. Um, please don't quote me. I'm, I'm making that up, though it sounds a bit plausible to me. But if a programmer learned that, the, challenge, the, the main question is not how do you ensure that this happens? The main question is how do you define these terms and extend them to new areas like a human, uh, challenge, uh, successful, uh, all the all the concepts there, how do we extend that? So I think that it would be beneficial for programmers to study psychology, um, but I think that the main the first challenge is to 
figure out how to extend the psychological concepts um, or to ensure that they're not um, avoid the good heart problem the make sure that humans are happy make sure that humans are flourishing make sure that humans uh, encounter challenges that um, they uh, that they thrive on all of those have terrible outcomes if they are interpreted by the AI in a way that's compatible with their meaning in our world, but is not compatible uh, in the in some extreme world that the AI can direct to. And uh, one last question, or no, maybe there'll be another one, but uh, a few more. When I read your, uh, sorry, Steve Burns asks, when I read your model spoon train post, I got the impression that the human brain equivalent would be feeling confused for predictive features or feeling conflicted for normative features. Do you agree? Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, I like the, uh, that formulation. Um, feeling conflicted, yeah, feeling morally confused, I'd say, instead of feeling conflicted. Because sometimes feeling conflicted is because there are too clear moral um, moral principles that we both agree that we agree on that are in conflict with each other or maybe sometimes just because it's i'm selfish and this is conflicting with my moral reasoning but the conflicted is i thought this always went together now it doesn't uh kind of thing children go through this phase quite a lot and people maturing in their political interpretation of things uh they tend to think that this is well, just any sort of thing, like say free markets always good, um, sort of young libertarians. And then, of course, it gets more complicated. The, even the concept of what the free market is gets more complicated. The what is good and what is not gets more complicated. And you end up with a nuanced view uh, with a, lo a lot, lot of complexity. But yeah, so morally conflicted, but morally conflicted of this This is the situation that where there is, yeah, a, a situation where my previous view of morality is insufficient rather than this is a conflict between clear, already clear moral principles. Joe Coleman asks, have you considered the implications of looking back at the training environment for competitiveness? If an AGI constantly needs to look back and reassess, might this end up being too high a safety tax? Um, the looking back to the training environment is for uh, values and preferences and goals or rewards, not for learning. I'd imagine that an AGI has become much, much more powerful since then and has most of its power comes from after that and that the information content of the training environment is relatively low. And it also would only be looking back in, ca in cases where it su suspects a model splintering or where it would be checking for this kind of situation. So I don't think that um, this would be a particularly high tax. Uh, Gerdich asks, Suppose we built an aligned human level AI that extends it in one of many ways to superhuman intelligence. Do you claim that if all those ways would agree on an action, that action is aligned? Um, that is, it at least has a very high probability of being the case. If, um, yeah, if when different systems of moralities or different systems of extending morality all point in the same direction, then there's a strong argument that that's the direction to go in. Um, the, generally, the challenge is when there's a certain number amount of disagreement, what to do in those cases. But if they all agree, of course, we might have been missing something hideous. But generally speaking, that's the, the easiest situation when everything agrees. Okay, uh, so let's take one more question before we go and uh, socialize. 
Uh, Roland mm -hmm. asks, maybe splintering and being confused is more like an indication uh, unknown of a known unknown by the time it happens. Then handling unknown unknowns being, means being able to prepare for future unknowns before they manifest. What are good strategies to prepare for the unknowns or if necessary, avoid them altogether? Um, I don't know <laughs> is the short answer, but um, this is sort of the challenge, automating this and automating this in code. There's, um, ah, I had, an, I had an insight when you were asking the question, but I forgot what it was. Um, oh, it's just a minor one. Avoiding them altogether might be a valid, it might be a valid situation. Like, suppose there was a species of humanoid that was a slave species that wanted to be slaves, that didn't enjoy being slaves, but wanted to be. Um, and this, the, this species would splinter some of our strongest intuitions about freedom, choice, and happiness um, that wanting and pleasure, wanting and enjoying are roughly aligned that people don't want to be intrinsically slave. So there is one set of, for mo most systems of morality, there's what do you do with such a species if it exists? So we're in, we're in Star Trek and we find them on a world, what do we do with them? But there might also be the option let's not create this species in the first place. Um, a lot of um, moral systems have an asymmetry between creating something and dealing with it once it's created. So avoiding going to some places is a perfectly valid option for some, it, it's some ways of, mis, uh, of, avo of avoiding these unknown unknowns. Or even, or known un, unknown unknowns, even. Okay. Uh, thank you, Stuart. So this is everybody's chance to unmute at long last, so we can applaud. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now is our chance to get together and talk to each other.